your your birthday by which i mean your solar return is your new year it's your christmas it's your national holiday it's the most potent time during the year to plant the seeds for a future that's filled with happiness and abundance so by the end of this talk i hope you'll agree that you'll never ignore your solar return again so hopefully after all our intro stuff that we were talking about while we we're waiting for the meeting to start you have your solar return chart handy if not just well we'll you can do it anytime after you listen to me here we are this is talk is the power in your solar returns there is a true power that happens when you imbue a moment in time whether it's an astrological aspect uh, a transiting conjunction anything with your intention with ritual with affirmation with just thinking about it and reflecting on it the more energy you put into an aspect the more powerful it becomes and i really believe that the solar return is the most powerful of all the things that happen to us in astrology because it's ours it's very individual so tonight i'm going to talk about what's a solar return and what information can we get from the solar return chart should you travel for your solar return and why and we'll look at some examples and then the best part i think is about how we can make the most of our solar returns so that's what we'll be talking about today okay what is a solar return some of you already really know what a solar return is but i want to start just a little bit at the beginning and level set for all of us a solar return is the exact moment that the sun returns to your natal solar position so if you're if you're solar degree is 19 degrees Capricorn when the Sun comes back around in a year to 19 degrees Capricorn a chart is drawn from that exact moment the solar return chart itself is the horoscope that's that's been created from that moment and it's interpreted as a snapshot of the year so it's interpreted as a snapshot of what's coming up for the year ahead and that means from the date of your birthday or the date of your solar return which is within a couple day or two of your birthday to, to the next year so the solar return starts on the solar return date which is uh, you can call it your birthday okay so how do you get the solar return chart some of you are already on top of this you already have an astrological program and but i want to make the point that your natal birth time should be accurate if your natal birth time isn't accurate in other words if you don't if you think if your birth if you look up your horoscope and you go like oh i was born sometime around eight o'clock in the morning that's not an accurate birth time if you know that's your accurate birth time that's fine if it's on your birth certificate that's what you go with but you really cannot do a solar return chart without an accurate birth time or without without a legal birth time because it it, it changes it changes every every four minutes an ascendant degree changes so it's really uh it, you you can't you you have to use computer calculations and what i always say is god bless computers because back in the day when i was first learning astrology we didn't have computers it was really really hard to do something like a solar return now it's super easy even for those of you who don't have a computer you just have to go online and google solar return calculations um, and they'll the website will come up a couple of different websites that allow you to put in your birth data and the when you want the solar return for and it'll it'll come up so we've got it and this is the most important thing i think you want to decide if the location of the solar return chart is natal your natal birthplace or local so there are some astrologers that feel it should be your natal birthplace i i'm in the there's when you when you do astrology you find out about astrology people 
um, have a lot of opinions about things. Then, and so some people really do think that you should use a natal location for everything, but I'm in the camp of people that believe it has to, that you're drawing it up for that moment, and the moment is where you are at that moment. So you have to, after you've made that decision, then you want to, then you put in that data and information into the, into the chart at that time. I think a question could come up of, well, what if you don't have an exact time? How are you going to do that? How, how, how are you going to make use of the information I'm talking about tonight? And I think what you can do is just look for the major aspects that are happening on your birthday. Look for the, you can't have a solar return chart, but you can have, um, you can have the transits of the day and look at the transits of the day for your birth, for your birthday or for when, yeah, for your birthday or for when um, it's the solar degree day, solar degree. I just didn't want to leave anybody out, but basically in terms of the rules of solar returns, you have to have your, your birth time. You have to have a birth time. How do you interpret solar returns? Once you have that chart, what are you looking for? Remember that the, the key words of astrology are true, whether it's a natal chart, a progressed chart, a transiting chart, a solar return chart, or any other type of chart. Your key words are still the same. So this, it's very similar to interpret a solar return chart that it is to interpret a, a natal chart. The, t the things that you look at for the solar return chart, the first thing you look at is the ascendant. The ascendant is going to be unique each year. Well, there's only 12 signs, so it'll be relatively unique. It's different each year. You're, the, the chart that comes up is, is different. It's, it has a different ascendant. Your solar degree will always be the same because that's what it's based on. But so you look at the ascendant and interpret that. Well, I'll give some examples in a minute. And then you look at the sun by house and aspect. And then you look at the chart ruler, the, ru the ruler of the ascendant uh, by sign and house and aspect. So those are the main things you look at. And you can look at everything else too if you want, but those are the main things to look at. So other things to consider would be uh, the planets and houses and the different life areas. And then you can also compare some of the points in a solar return chart to your natal chart to see if you've got any other conjunctions or major transits coming up in the year ahead. Okay, so here's, the, here's what I'm going to be using for, here's what I'm going to be using for uh, our examples tonight. And the first thing, is, the, the reason I'm going to be using Meghan Markle or the Duchess of Sussex and her spouse, Prince Harry, is because, for a couple of different reasons. One is I'm going to be talking about traveling for your solar return. And number two is, so I'm going to be talking about traveling for your solar return. And I'm going to be talking about, um, and these, these are people that we can read about in the news, see in the news all the time, and, and, and we know a lot about them. We know where they are at any given time. There's they're always something that, uh, it, that we're doing that. What, what's happening is we have Meghan Markle's chart. She does have an accurate birth time. It's from her birth certificate. It was rated AA by Astro Data Bank. What, I'm, what we're looking at, this is just her natal chart. So I'm just going to point out a few things because I want to go through these things sort of quickly, not in depth, but that she's a sun, sun and Leo person. Her moon is in Libra, conjunct Saturn and Jupiter. That's a wow chart right there. And then um, Cancer rising. So she has these factors in her natal chart. What about the solar return chart? So I have three solar return charts here for Meghan Markle. The first one is from her natal location. Canoga Park is a neighborhood of Los Angeles. And so she's, she's back in the LA area. And that's where she is right now at 
at this very moment, well, I don't know about this very moment, but that's where they're living. I just read they bought a $15 million house in Los Angeles. That was in the news today because it's inevitable that you'll see some news about either Megan or Harry in the news. And then the advantage of that, the advantage of looking at celebrity charts in general is that you can find out a lot about them, what they're doing, what the stresses in their life are, their, their financial uh, wealth, and you can find out a lot of things about them and then you can compare them to the, the chart that you're looking at. It's a great way to learn about people and that's a lot of times that's why astrologers use famous people as their examples. But here's her solar return chart. So let's walk through it real, you know, relatively briefly. So her ascendant, if she is in, in August 3rd, 2020, if she's in the Los Angeles area, her ascendant is going to be zero degrees Sagittarius, zero, zero, which is, if you want to think about that being sort of a keynote symbol for the year ahead, how she'll look at the life for the year ahead, what sort of things will be uh, in her life in the year ahead, then it's going to be Sagittarius things. So if you have Sagittarius rising, you're sort of upbeat, happy, generous, open-hearted, open-spirited, and uh, maybe interested in learning and things like that. So that's, that would be her year ahead sort of keynote that would be your year ahead keynote what's the rising sign uh her son in leo is 11 degrees leo 59 minutes just like it is over here in her natal chart so the solar degree is always the same that's the definition of the solar return chart and if you look at her aspect for the the year you can you can see the as the sun is in the ninth house so again, there's a sort of a, a symbolic correspondence between the ninth house and her rising sign Sagittarius. So we're expecting that uh, Princess Margaret is going to Princess or Princess Meghan is going to be doing a lot of traveling, and that that we already know that we already know that's very likely for her because they're living in three places. They're living in Los Angeles. They're living in. Toronto and they're living in their residence in London as well. So they could they could be anywhere and they have charitable foundations that they also travel to. So she could be anywhere in her birthday. But if she's in Los Angeles area, this would the sun in the ninth house that would symbolize a lot of travel in the year ahead. Also the aspects to her son, uh sun's opposed the moon, which is a fine aspect, but um, you can see that the sun and the moon are squared to the to, squared to Uranus in the solar return chart. So that is that could mean a lot of excitement, a lot of unexpected things. It could mean because the Uranus is in the a sixth house, it could be unexpected health issues. All kinds of different things could pop up for her. The the aspects in a solar return chart are going to be the same, no matter where you where they're located you cannot get rid of an aspect by traveling for your solar return what you can do by traveling for your solar return is change the house that the planets are in so here if if you've got like like she does like have a major conjunction this coming year jupiter pluto saturn we're all going to have that at some point but in her her los angeles chart it's in the second house. So there's bound to be conflicts about money in her life because there's conflicts about money in their life right now. The conflicts that they had with the, the money that they were getting from working for the Queen of England. And then there's conflicts with, uh, undoubtedly, with the money that Meghan will be making from her Hollywood projects as opposed to her husband being the, the major money maker in the family. So that's, that's just things you, you would look at in her chart. It could be quite different if it's your chart. So now we have two other charts here. What if Meghan Markle had her solar return in Toronto, Canada, right? So Sagittarius would still be rising. You have, sometimes you have to move really far away to make the rising sign change. You have to move at least, uh, depending on where your birth area is, it could be like two time zones away, which Toronto is at least two, two time zones or more away. And then 
so then it puts her son in the eighth house. And we were talking with Alan Salmi earlier about the son in the eighth house. It doesn't mean every time your son is in the solar return in the eighth house, that does not mean that you're going to die. It means that you're probably, in her case, it's probably going to be very involved with other people's money, her husband's money. There's, there's a lot of different issues that has to do with the royal family and their money and where it comes from and who has it and who doesn't have it and all that stuff. So the son in the eighth house still emphasizes the money issues, but it's, you know, it's, it's not as much fun as if your son was in the ninth and it had to do with traveling, if you like traveling, right? So the aspect is still there. This time the Uranus square to the sun is in the fourth house. So it could indicate things having to do with um, having living out of different issues, having to do with being in one home environment and then having to quickly move to another home environment. Does that make sense? Hopefully that makes sense to you all. And then we have her, if she's in London, then her chart's really different. You can see how much it moves. She'd be have a 24 Aries rising. Mars would be in that karmic zone or the Gokulan zone, however you call it, that uh, right conjunct her first house cusp. So if she has her birthday and celebrates her birthday in London, I think her whole year will be a lot more margin, a lot more filled with arguments, that kind of thing, a lot, lot more battles to be fought. Does that make sense? Hopefully. And then it puts her son in the fifth house which could, it, okay, if you were picking a chart to move to, to for your solar return, and if you, if for example, wanted to be pregnant and you wanted to imbue that moment with an affirmation of having a child, then you might want to put your son in the, in the fifth house in your chart. So that, that's something to think about as you're going to be looking at your own charts, right? So in the fifth house, maybe London will have more pleasures, more fun, more. So that could be really quite, that's really quite compatible with somebody who has their son in Leo. It's, it's things to think about with this. It puts all this stuff up in her area, which is her house of career, the 10th house, and the Jupiter, Pluto, Saturn. So if she goes back to London for her birthday, the arguments that she has may be about where she's going in her career. That's real typical stuff for that. And now, so now we've got her spouse, her husband, Harry, Prince of Wales. He is a Virgo with Capricorn rising and the moon in Taurus. So compared to that Leo person that his wife is, his, his personality factors are really more subdued. And I think, um, this will, you'll see how this plays out a little bit in the, in his, solar return chart. So I did his for London, because that's basically where he was born. And so his, his solar return ascendant is Libra. And his son is in the 11th house. And let's see, what are the aspects? And it's opposed Neptune. I think that son opposed Neptune is going to be for him for his year ahead that starts September 15th, 2020 may be where he's questioning a lot his identity. And that's what he's doing right now anyway. Who is he? Is he, is his wife, you know, the, the princess of Wales, or is he Miss, Mr. Meghan Markle? So I think that's his identity. When you, when you have that Neptune, like, who am I? Who am I? What am I doing here? Is the uh, Neptune opposed the sun? So that's going to be wherever he is. In this case, it'll be, you know, it could be, I don't know, for, for those of you who have kids, did this ever happen to you? you? You've just had a baby and you go to visit people and they don't pay any attention to you. They're only paying attention to the babies. So, you know, if he's, if he's in London, his personality or his, his identity may be overridden by, you know, the wonderful children that, you know, he has one wonderful child, I'm sure he'll have another because that's what they do um, for their lineage. And, so that, that's part of what, what the factor here. Libra, 
means he'll be he'll seem very nice he'll get along with people that's that's sort of what you're um, what you would look for in London so he might be very comfortable in London as opposed to his wife not being very comfortable in London so that's something that you can look at when you're doing comparisons of people's solar return charts in Los Angeles he has cancer rising that's just another sort of quiet internal type of sign all the energy is in his seventh house where his wife's energy is so that's what happens if his if he has a solar return in Los Angeles right and then if if they go to Toronto it's really different because when he goes to Toronto you know um, Canada still has that association with the um, with the with with Great Britain and so when he goes to Canada he's like he's he's the royal so instead of being in Los Angeles where things would be quiet and peaceful and he's not really anybody exactly um, com with all the other stars around but when if he goes to Toronto and has his birthday there it'll be a year of where it would be more powerful for him so that's why um, and I want to say I give a shout out to San Antonio astrologer Barbara Novak she's the one who inspired me on the solar return journey uh, I was at the ARC in 1993 I think and she gave a talk on traveling for your solar return and it was super enlightening I don't always travel for my solar returns, but just to be able to think about that you, you can't really change your karma in that way, but you can soften it, you can adapt it. And that's one of the reasons I say solar returns are so powerful is because this is a power that you as an individual can have to actually change your horoscope. You know what I mean? It's, you, can, you can do something. Sometimes you don't have the ability to travel, but sometimes you have the ability to look at charts. So here's a couple more to, to take a look at. This is Nikki's chart. This is her solar return that actually happened this year, March 29th, 2020, uh, 1230 p.m. And I use Chicago as the place, but it's possible that she could have traveled. I didn't know, but I, I used uh, Chicago. My question is, should she have traveled for a solar return? And I want to say that it depends on your goals. Okay, so here's uh, Nikki's rising sign, which is Cancer in the solar return chart. So it would be a year that would be more concerned with home and family. The her outlook on life might be a lot um, of being concerned with home and family and uh, people in her family and, and that type of thing. But some people would want the sun to be at the top of the chart because it makes the sun a lot more powerful. And so that could be a really good thing. But if, if Nikki was married, then, um, and she had this stellium in her fourth house, she might want to change that. So I have a couple other charts for her to look at even though she can't do it anymore and travel for her solar return. I want you to see how different the charts can be if uh, you're in a different, different place, but and sometimes how far you have to move to, to change it. So I did this one for Hawaii, it's sort of small here, but I just want you to see that it, the, all the, the stellium moved into the 10th house. Now, if, if she was a super career person, she might really want that, even with the, with the Pluto and Mars and Saturn there, she might want that Jupiter at the top of the chart, you know, take charge, be the CEO of the corporation. Um, but that would be if, if you want to change things, go. And then you could see that if, if her birthday had been in Hawaii, Uranus is right on the ascendant. And if somebody wants to make a break from their routine or their change, and they really need to break free and they want freedom, more freedom in their life, then they would go towards that. I want to be honest and say that Hmm, I'm not so sure having a malefic on an angle is really a good idea, okay? That's, that's just me. I don't go looking for trouble. But sometimes you want to put a certain energy in a certain place for your solar return. And that's one way to do it. Then we, um, if Nikki had wanted to travel to London, then, um, and for her birthday, then it would have put that whole stellium of things in the fourth house and that would have symbolized a year ahead where you know where there's a lot of 
probably turbulence in in family life. It, so if you were if you were in London and you wanted to get that out of there, sometimes um, sometimes people recommend trying to put tough planets into the twelfth house. Um, I'm never sure how what how much I want with that kind of stuff in my unconscious mind, but it's a way if you put things into a cadent house, it can sort of take some of the power away from them. And so then if Nikki was thinking that she would like to get married, then maybe she'd want to have her birthday in London because it puts the sun into the house of partnerships. And, you know, so if she was looking for partnerships, then it could be that kind of thing. So that's, that's, I think I have another one, Judy. Hey, Judy. So uh, this is, would you travel for, for this solar return? And should Judy travel for a solar return, which comes up, February 2nd, 2021. One of the things that I saw when I looked at her chart for, for that solar return is that she has Neptune conjunct her ascendant in this chart. Um, I think if you want to be very spiritual, be a monk living in a cave, um, not really worried too much about the outside world, if you wanted to focus more on your, your night dreams, a lot of, do a lot of sleeping, probably Neptune's good. Most often, if you have Neptune conjunct your Ascendant solar return chart, after you get finished with this year, you'll go like, what the heck did I do? I just don't even remember. So it's, it's really um, a, a lot of forgetfulness type of things, amne amnesia type of things. So it's, it would be probably good to travel for that. Also, Judy, your son would be in the 12th house in that year ahead. So it really means a lot of interning, internalizing type of things. So if you, if you want to get it out, I mean, you don't have to go to Hawaii or London or Japan to, to move it. All you have to do is, I don't know if you can see this, but if you, go, if you were in Denver for your solar return, then it would put the sun, it sun's in the, it sun's in the 12th house, but Mercury's conjunct the ascendant. And Neptune's in the first house, but um, intercepted. So it changes that entirely. A lot of stuff actually puts just about everything in the 12th house. I'm not sure. It's like people have to think about, you have to think about what are your goals? What are you trying to achieve in the year ahead? And again, and maybe it's just me because I'm a Capricorn and I'm about achievement. So I'm thinking, what do I want to achieve? You know, what are my goals in the year ahead? Because if you don't have goals, then anything anything can happen so you want to you want to have where your you where your thoughts go energy flows and results show so you want to be thinking about this these types of things and you want to be thinking about it at least a month ahead of your birthday so that you have time to say what do i want to do what do i want to achieve what do i want to accomplish and you could also go to new york not that far away and it puts all this stuff into the 11th house, which is sort of fun, because if you're a group person, like if you belong to groups like NCGR, and you like, like being in, in um, associations, being with friends, then you might want to put your son in the 11th house. And Neptune intercepted in the, in the 12th house. So it's not bothering you. Of course, you know, it brings Uranus and Mars into the first house. You really have to say, what, what do I want? What, which planets can help me achieve the things that I want to achieve for the year ahead? And what are the aspects to them? So those are some examples. And I want to stop there and see if anybody has any questions from what I've talked about so far. Oh, this is an excellent question from Lauren. She says, do you need to stay at the place of the solar return for a certain amount of time? And the answer is, I was told, yes, you can't just go for a day trip. It should be for at least for several days to establish your residency there. So I think you have to go for longer than just overnight. Um, but I would, but as a, as a symbolist, as a person who believes in symbols, and being able to do rituals and things. I would say if you're really trying to change things, you don't have an option and you can go overnight to someplace and stay overnight and have your solar return exact time be in that location. I would say that's, 
better, that's, that's like doing something. When you imbue your intentions, those of you who do metaphysical, I forget what the word is, mitigation, remediation, when you do things like that, Alan knows the word. And it's, it's, doing things, it's doing things, whether it's rituals or intentions or positive thinking or visualization or taking action in a certain way, it, it creates an energy flow. Residency for how long? Yeah, I'd say a couple of days, Sheila. Just, um, just a, I think a couple of days is good. Is what I was told by by people who do this kind of thing who really travel for their solar return a lot. If you, tr if you, wait, I'm trying to read Taylor's thing. If you travel for your solar return, do you believe you won't experience the lessons you're supposed to experience for that year? Well, I think yes. I think generally speaking, remember your primary chart is your natal chart. So you have your natal chart and you have the transits and progressions to your natal chart. That probably in some ways overrides the solar return chart. The solar return is like just a snapshot. It's uh, like a sentence, uh, uh, you know, like a, a paragraph, or a sentence, a paragraph. It's just, it's just a little bit. And, but the, the full flushed out what you experience is your whole transits and progressions for that year ahead. So I think that's more powerful. However, I think there's something wrong with thinking that you have to learn a certain lesson in a certain way. That's like saying you deserve bad karma because you don't you know, or you deserve something, or you deserve, you know, that, and maybe you weren't saying that, so I'm not, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's really important for people to think about that you don't, there's no requirement that you have bad things happen to you. We, we, I mean, there's plenty of stuff that happens all the time, right? It's, it's not like life is like, you know, merrily, 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 gently down the stream. We, we don't do that, but we mm, we can stay out of trouble, number one, and we can do things that soften your karma. This is the this is the yoga that I've been taught through the Temple of Kriya Yoga and my Guru Goswami Kriyananda, and this is where my intersection of the yoga philosophy and astrology come together, and it has a lot to do with the fact that we have a tremendous amount of, I don't want to call it free will, but we have a tremendous amount of input. We're allowed to say what we want. And what we want, or for think, well, what I want, that may be what you want, but what I want is for things to be harmonious. I want things to be, I want to, to be able to grow and I want to have love in my life. I, and when I talk about, I'm going to talk about how to celebrate your birthday next. I'm going to talk about this a little bit more. So you know, uh, I, I wouldn't worry about the less missing any lessons in life for moving. It's not like you're trying to like those old stories about somebody trying to run away from death and then they meet a, they run to the next town. So death won't catch them. And then death is there to meet them. Those, those type of things. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, I think I, I'm not going to talk about individual charts, but I definitely think Lynn that, um, that we're not, nobody's going to escape the Jupiter-Pluto conjunction or the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. It's going to be there somewhere, but where would you like it to be, you know, in your solar return? It's always going to be somewhere also by transit in your natal chart, which is also going to have a big impact. But we're, what we're doing is we're trying to say, hey, this is what I want. Did you know you can ask for what you want? Ask for what you want. Can't hurt. All right. Yeah, or being, you can be conscious. It, that's what astrology is. Astrology is a way of being conscious about what's happening to us. I think that's really important. Norm and Sue. Sue and Norm. I'm going to um, share my screen again and get going, but thanks for your questions, and we'll, we'll, we'll pause again to do that. Here we go. You see my screen, right? And it says, celebrate your birthday. It's important. This is, a, this is important. Some astrologers 
believe that what comes into your life on your birthday, or really your solar return, and the day before and the day after symbolizes what's coming into your life for the year ahead. So if you're just being an observer, you can journal about the type of people that you meet. That'll give you some insights into the, what's coming up for the year ahead, the gifts that you're given, the special food that you eat at your birthday, or any unusual events. So then you check your symbolic correlations in between your birthday events or your solar return events, and then your everyday life as it unfolds for the year. It's almost like what happens on those couple of days around your birthday is like your tarot card. It's your symbolic description of your year ahead. And I feel, and some other astrologers feel, that you can take an active part in the process, sort of like what we we're talking about before, by consciously doing rituals, by consciously doing internal processes like affirmations. But um, externally, you can use any sort of actions that embody the symbols that highlight what you want to bring into your life for the, for the year ahead. So if you, you know, if you, if you want to travel to Japan in the year ahead, go to a Japanese restaurant on your birthday. If you want to bring art and culture into your life, go to the Art Institute around your birthday, you know, within a, the day, a couple of days before and the day after. It's really the most potent time. If you want to, um, if, if you want to do financial things, you know, put money into a bank or an envelope with your, with your goal, your financial goal written on it. But, but imbue it with some power, read a book, talk to, talk to the people, get together with the people that you really want to see. If there's people that you don't really want to see, plan the party with them like a week before or a week later, but not exactly on your birthday. If you want to emphasize your personal objectives, you might want to take the day off of work, you know, one of the days off of work and have that personal time. But if you have financial goals, you might want to go to work and be there in, you know, in the action, in the place where it's happening for, for financial things. So try to think about what you want. So a lot of this really ties in with writing down your goals and preparing, uh, preparing your goals for the year ahead. But the year ahead doesn't start at January 1st. It starts on your birthday, on your solar return day. So like I said, I usually start thinking about, I print out my solar return. I start thinking about my solar return a month before. I start printing it out. I start writing on, uh, I print it on a piece of paper and I start writing things out on it. And you can use different symbols and rituals like, like that. So I do, what, sometimes people call it treasure mapping. And treasure mapping is a type of, is a visual of what you want to come into your life for, for whatever goals you have. It doesn't have to be for the year ahead. But for us as astrologers, we know how important timing is. You have to create affirmation. You don't have to. I didn't mean to say that. But in order to do treasure mapping the way that I do it, you create affirmations. And affirmations should start out with something like, I am, I am healthy, I am wealthy. You can start with I am or I have or um, every day in every way, life is getting better and better. Whatever the phrase is for you, it has to be a positive phrase. Don't use an affirmation like I will stop smoking because in your head, it like smoking will be just in your head all the time. You have to say, um, I choose to be, I like the ones like I choose. I choose to be healthy and I accept life's gift of radiant health. Something like that. So make a positive statement and I'll, I'll show you some examples as, as we go forward with this. Visualize your goals by, with the treasure mapping, by uh, cutting out pictures, drawing pictures, it, or just even clarifying in your mind what your goals are is okay way to do it. But for treasure mapping, you usually have pictures. And in the old days, 
we'd sit around doing this. I used to do some workshops like this, and we'd sit around with stacks of magazines in front of us and, and cutting out pictures. Um, I don't have too many magazine subscriptions anymore, especially not the ones with the good pictures, but there's plenty of places to Google a picture of whatever you want and then, you know, and, and sort of scan through them and find pictures for what you want to do. So to help you visualize your goal. And then the concept, this concept that I started to talk about before, I call it trining your squares. And trining your squares means astrologically and philosophically that you're looking at an aspect, like we were talking about somebody with the sun squared Uranus before. And you look at the aspect and you try to separate separated away from the square. The square is that obstructive aspect, that uh, margin energy in the aspect. And you say, but what if I have all this energy in the sun and Uranus or in even in uh, the moon and Saturn, something really hard like that. If I have that energy, what could I do with, what could I do constructive with that energy? How could I how can, instead of squaring, how can I make them trining? How can I make those planets harmonious with one another? And one of the ways to do it is to take that aspect and look it up in an astrology book, like, you know, we call them cookbooks, where they write out every single aspect, every single aspect of planet and all the different configurations. And so instead of saying, oh, here's the sun squared Uranus, what does it say for the sun trying Uranus? What does it say? What are those keywords for the sun sextile in Uranus? Or what does it say for Jupiter trining Pluto? And then you, see, then you make that your, your visualization and think about that things can come unexpectedly and harmoniously into your life. The things that you can be creative and you know, have vitality and creativity can be part of your life. So trining your squares means that, again, that you don't have to accept that this aspect coming up is going to be like the worst aspect ever, because that's what sometimes people do with astrology. And that's really a very, it's, it's not that you don't want to be realistic. And when you're counseling people um, with astrology, you want to be honest and not be too light. But when you're doing it for yourself, after you understand what it could mean, then you want to say, but here's all this energy. I could probably do something else with it other than suffer. And then what, you look for that. You, could, you start trining your squares and think about it that way. So you definitely want to look for, look for that and do your treasure mapping with it. So let's take a look at what some um, treasure maps look like. And so these are just some I clipped out of the, you know, out of the internet, out of Google Images. And this is the way people do it who aren't astrologers. And they just, and all you do is you put your goal in the middle or you put your goal somewhere and you, and you do put lots of pictures around, lots of images that tell your mind and tell your, to, to get into your subconscious mind with images, what you'd like to bring into your life. So that's how people treasure map. This is how I treasure map, this is one I did 20 years ago because I realized I haven't done any big ones in a long time. This is a whole big poster board. I put my chart in the middle and then I start putting things into houses. So I think put things about physical stuff and life outlook in the first house. I put things about money in the second house. I put things about my home environment in the fourth house. I put things that have to do with love and relationships in the seventh house, things that have to do with career put some things at the top, like overarching goals and so on, travel in the ninth house. And you just make a whole big poster board. It's not great art. You can do it with drawing it yourself. If you're a, if, whether or not you're a good artist, you can do it with drawing symbols, pictures, tarot cards, any of this stuff, just, just do it. But for now, um, you can just take your image. Now, this is... This is my solar return from a couple of years ago, right? And you write your positive keywords, you write your affirmations, and you put some visual images on there. And then you look at it. So I, in this solar return, I've got the Venus and the Sun and Pluto conjuncting my 10th house cusp with the solar return chart. Woo! -hoo! For Capricorns, right? 
and uh, so I wrote in the, in this in the tenth house space. It's empty, but this is all conjunct the tenth house. I wrote the things that I wanted to be doing: writing, teaching, consulting, speaking, being creative, whatever you want to whatever you want to do. You write your tenth house goals, right? And then I could see that the sun was making a uh, sextile to the Mars and Jupiter. So I wanted in the seventh house. So I wanted to read have something to do that. I have loving and productive partnerships because Capricorns like to be productive, right? So I, so I use the words that, use the words that make sense to you. You, you. If somebody, if you read an affirmation that somebody's written, even as wonderful as Louise Hay is, and she's my favorite affirmation writer, that um, do, you can rewrite them, write them in words that make sense to you. I think that's really important. And then, uh, what else did I do? Then I saw that I had the, the Mercury and Saturn conjunction there. So I wrote my keywords, sometimes just positive keywords, discipline, communication, spiritual study. Those are the things I wanted to do in that year. And then I saw that I also had the uh, moon opposed Uranus. So I wrote some positive keywords, creative insights. Uranus in the 12th house, anything can pop out of the 12th house creatively when you have Uranus going through that house. It's exciting times. And then for the moon, my uh, chiropractor gave me this affirmation. And it has to do with balance and release. My body can and will release and rebalance itself. So that, that, those are some of the things that I wrote. And then I put a couple images. Oh, and the, the ascendant. Well, I love Taurus rising. It, and, oh, I know, I want to say this about rising signs and solar return charts. If you have a computer or, or, or you have access to the, the things on the internet where you can do the calculations, go back in time and look at the pattern of your rising sign and uh, of your solar return charts and compare it to the years as you went to. If you can sort of remember the, and say, was this the theme for the year? Was it... Did I enjoy the years that I had Taurus rising or did I like the years that I had Sag rising better or did I really like the Scorpio rising years? What, what try, see if you can coordinate. That's how you like, learn and remember your solar return stuff. Yeah, and then I put some pictures. Um, that's the goddess Tara, Buddhist goddess Tara. And then I, you know, you can paste pictures in. You just cut them out, you know, print them off on your printer, cut them out. Um, from the internet, paste them on your little piece of paper or draw them in. And then you take that. And for me, I, I put it in my meditation room. So I'm looking at it every day. And then um, I'm remembering, I'm remembering and remembering what I want this, these aspects to do for me. I want them to work for me. They're my aspects. Give them to me. I want it. I think um, asking for what you want is a really important spiritual practice. Okay, let's go to the next screen. I, I told Janet I would look at her chart. This is Janet's chart. And let me, let me take a look at it. So Pis her, her in a few days, happy birthday, Janet. I'm wishing you a wonderful, wonderful year Thank you. ahead. Thank you. So um, we've got a Pisces rising with Neptune in the first house. Not quite as intense as the one we're looking at for Judy, where it was conjunct the ascendant, but it could be, you know, again, spiritual, spirituality, interning, psychic discoveries, insights into the inner mind, if you're looking at it in a positive way. You know, everybody knows what the ones that are negative are. But Neptune, so Neptune in the first house, you know, spaciness, forgetfulness, you know, that kind of thing too. But definitely for people who are um, psychically oriented, having Neptune there is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a sensitivity, fa extra sensitivity factor. But so that's, but that's the outlook. It'd be more, you'll be more, you'll be more gentle, Janet. You'll be more <laughs> Piscean. So, but uh, then, yeah, uh, she's saying good luck with that. And so uh, then we have uh, the sun Uranus conjunction, right? And the sun and Uranus are, um, uh, squaring Saturn. So I was looking at that and I was thinking about some affirmations that could go 
with that and some ritual things. So online, I still found this candle, which, because this is in the house of money. Uh, so this is where your second house is. So this is a wonderful green money candle with a picture of the nine of pentacles on it, which is one of my favorite cards that shows the woman of wealth and leisure in her garden with all her money around her, or little pentacles around her. So that, that's your positive symbol. And the affirmations are, because of the Uranus, I now, this is probably from Louise Hay, God bless her, may she rest in peace. I now receive my good from expected and unexpected sources. Because a lot of times we're only thinking about our year ahead that, oh, you know, I know I make my money this way, this way, this way. But you have to be open to unexpected good as well. So that's why I have the other one. I'm open and receptive to new avenues of income. So because you never know. It could be it's, it's surprises. So that could be um, wonderful new things. And then, the, then I was reflecting on this, this. And this is what everybody needs to do with theirs. You reflect on it. You think about it. You don't jump to a conclusion about your chart. You think about what could this mean? What could this mean? But I, I, this is the affirmation that I put here. I rejoice in other successes, knowing there's plenty for us all. I'm pretty sure this is from Louise Hay as well. And the reason I put that there is because I think that can be a real block for people is, is jealousy or just like seeing somebody wealthy and saying, I hate rich people. Because then that means if you ever got rich, you'd hate yourself and then you block yourself from being rich. Does that make sense? They say that in a lot of books about motivation and money and prosperity consciousness, that you need to really accept the abundance for other people as well. So that, and that's in your 12th house. So you want to make sure that your consciousness is happy for other people and, and, the, and the good things that are happening for them. And that opens up the pathway for the, those unexpected good things to come into your life. So that, that's the kind of things that I would do with my solar return chart if this, if this one were mine. And that's, that's what we're looking at here. Okay. And I, what I'd like to do now is me take a break from talking. And I, I just put this up here for people who weren't, aren't maybe familiar with all the houses. And in the Power, PowerPoint that, I, that you can download, there you have this page, it has the circle. But you could just make a circle on a piece of paper if you don't have your solar return chart and just write some affirmations. So I'm going to be quiet for about four minutes and I'm going to have you write your, your affirmations. So we're all going to be quiet except for this is my computer sound, which hopefully you'll hear. Just go ahead and write your affirmations and your positive keywords. Okay, guys. Hope you got some good things to take with you. I've got a little bit more to go, and then we can have some more time for Q&A. So let's talk about other planetary returns, because it doesn't, you don't have to just do this with your solar return, but the solar return, I believe, is like the most important because it comes every year. So it's a cycle we really understand and can pay attention to. Some of us can't pay attention to stuff longer you know, than, than that. But the, the most commonly used returns that people look at is the Mars return, the Jupiter return, and the Saturn return. The, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's people that work with all the returns. Some people probably work with lunar returns, and, which come up every month. But that's just like, that's a little bit too much work for me. But it could be interesting if you enjoy doing things like that, is do a lunar return and look at your month ahead and do a ritual for your month ahead. Uh, other people do their monthly rituals like at the new moon or new moon or full moon. So that, that's one that goes by really fast. That people might use uh, Mercury returns every year. Venus returns approximately every year or so in a few months maybe. People don't, those cycles you could do a return chart for. I don't use the, those ones, but the commonly used is Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. You understand that Uranus, your Uranus return happens about age 84. So most likely you're only gonna get one of those. So definitely if you're getting close to 84 years old, then please do that, that return and see what's coming up for that. Um, <clears throat> then the um, Uran Neptune and Pluto are like several hundred years 
uh, before you're going to get a return. So unless something miraculous happens, which it could in the, in the, in the next X number of years or so, you know, maybe somebody will get to their Neptune return. But in the meantime, let's, I'm going to talk real briefly about the Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn returns so that you can use those. They're interpreted just like the solar return, and you can create affirmations and rituals for those. I always look at my Mars returns and, my, of course, my Jupiter and Saturn returns. So Mars happens, Mars return is every two years. And basically, just look at the ascendant, the house Mars is in, and the aspects to Mars, right? So every two years, and it's, it, it's really helpful because it's another start, another beginning. So if you're trying to begin a new project, doing it your Mars return, especially if you have a good Mars in your natal chart, could be really helpful. Um, it signifies Martian things like energy and activity and all the things that Mars rules. Jupiter only happens every 12 years. That makes it more impactful in a lot of ways. Jupiter return is very positive, very powerful. You definitely want to say your wishes. You want to tell the universe what you want at your Jupiter return. You look at the ascendant, look through the house Jupiter's in, look to the aspects to Jupiter, but think about what do you want to grow and expand in your life in the next 12 years? Whatever you started that Jupiter return is going to expand and grow for the next 12 years. What do you want to study? What do you want to learn? Start those things. Even if it's just, you know, if you want to learn Japanese, learn one word, you know, learn sayonara or learn konnichiwa or something. Just a few words just on that, at that day or that moment, and then it'll expand. If you want to travel, if you want to do any of the things that Jupiter symbolizes, do something to, to impregnate that moment because what, it, because a 12 year growth pattern is a long time for something to grow and to come into your life. It's a wonderful, wonderful aspect to have your Jupiter return. People don't always like their Saturn returns because it's Saturn, but it happens to everybody. So it happens every 28 or 29 years, depending on your, your chart. And you look at the ascendant, the house Saturn's in, and the aspects to Saturn. But Saturn returns, they, they, signify the things that are going to stick with you for the next 28 years. So be careful of what you start during Saturn returns because it will be a keynote or a key factor in your life over those next 28 years. And it, Saturn can be structure. Saturn can be building things. Saturn can be constructive, but a Saturn can also be limitation. And I'm just going to take a personal moment to say that at my first Saturn return, I really strongly affirmed that I wanted to teach and do readings. But this, this comes, the reason I'm telling you this is because it comes with a warning. So I have been doing it all these years, um, you know, past that Saturn return, that, that I did do that. I did it, I did it, and I did it. But I did not make a lot of money doing it. Okay, so that's my qualifier. You might want to pick a different aspect if you're starting something. But I desperately at that time when I was young and I had young children, I wanted to affirm that this was something that I didn't want to let go of. I wanted it to be in my life. And it's been a really good thing in my life. It's just, you know, it just depends what your goals are. If your goals are financial, Saturn, return, Saturn things build slowly over time. And I'm just putting put down Saturn returns are different. It's way you're you're 56, age 56, 57, your Saturn return is way different. But it still has to do with the things you want to bring into your life. But the things that you want to hold on to throughout those next 28 years are different. And the way that you look at life is different. And that's what makes the Saturn returns different. And I think my personal opinion is sometimes the Saturn returns are easier in the in, in at, at 56 because you un, you have a definitely a greater understanding of life and the cycles of life and the things that how things come in and your life is up and up and down and up and down in life and that what seems to be permanent is impermanent and you find that out when you're older and 84 I haven't done that yet so 
but it's definitely you're looking at life in a in a different way at age 84 than you definitely are at age 56. So so think about that as you're going into your Saturn returns, and you want to know what what do I really 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 want to keep in my life, because it will it will stick around with you. And be careful of of what you say and affirm at that time, because it has to be it has to be your your true I call it your true overarching goal. What do you really, really want? But what is it something that you can really want for a really long time? Thank you very much to the Northern Illinois chapter of NCGR for having me as your speaker for April 2020.